Well, good Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We've got folks at the beach today. It is November late. For those of you watching from colder climates on live stream, 85 degrees today. Always a challenge in ministry in San Diego. So much else to be doing today, but we thank you for being here this morning. It's great to be back with you today. I felt that today, instead of opening to the book of Psalms to open our service, that we would do a little bit of prayer for our nation. Today, if you would join me in prayer, a number of you have prayer guides and things that help you in prayer. I've picked up a book this year, Prayers That Avail Much, and it's really been helpful in various elements of my own prayer life. So, Father, you are our God. And we proclaim the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him, for he laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean's depths. We come to you, Lord. We come to you as a congregation. We ask you for the nation of the United States. We pray that the leaders of our nation have godly knowledge and wisdom, and it shall be pleasing to them. Guard them with your understanding, Lord. Keep them from wickedness. Those who do not want what is right, but what is evil and dishonest. We thank you, Lord, that not only, that only the godly and those with integrity shall rule, and the wicked shall be removed and uprooted. That those in authority will scatter the wicked from the good like wheat running through a threshing wheel. And that these godly leaders are protected, Lord, by your unfailing love and your faithfulness. We pray, Lord, that the hearts of those in authority are controlled by you. Just as the channel of water is controlled and directed to whatever end you choose. We pray that they love justice and with righteousness. Because their throne is established through righteousness. We thank you that they take pleasure in honesty. And they value those who speak what is right. For when a country is led by a leader with understanding and knowledge, it will continue to grow strong. We pray that righteousness will thrive so that the people will rejoice. We thank you that your word will be spread throughout this nation by your army, causing more people to believe on you because we have seen with our very own eyes your Yeshua, your salvation. Make this nation a light to all nations for your kavod in the name of Yeshua. We come against any spirit of terrorism in the name of Yeshua today, worldwide, Lord. We thank you that no weapon forged against us will prosper as your children. We thank you, Lord, that as we move into Acharit Hayamim, into the last days, Lord, we are seeing the things that the prophets prophesied about. Father, we are getting extremely close. So, Father, would you wake us up this morning to what really is happening? To go beyond the surface and to see the spiritual battle that we are warring against in the spirit. We thank you, Lord, that there's no distance, in a sense, in the spirit. And so we thank you for Malachim, for angels, Lord, that are dispatched to do your bidding in this earth, to protect us in the name of Yeshua. We agree by saying amen. Amen. El Melech Naaman, God is a faithful king. If you'd stand with me today, the Matavu is a prayer of our people. It is an ancient prayer that speaks life today. The scriptures show us of enemies of his people, and so today Israel has many enemies in their neighborhood. And, but God is in charge of changing the intentions of those who desire to bomb and curse Israel. And out of Balaam's mouth, God changed his intention of cursing our people and blessed Israel with these beautiful words of praise. Please join me from the scripture. Ma tohovu o halecha yaakov mishkenotecha Israel. Oh, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Lord, we love your house 
and your honor's dwelling place. We ask you, Lord, would you answer each and every one of us today with Yeshua, your true and only salvation. Do me a favor, cross the aisle, introduce yourself to your neighbor, welcome them to Tree of Life in the name of our God today. our children this morning if you'd come forward all right hallelujah al if you'd come forward daniel all right yes we have a great program every shabbat for these young ones and they're excited to be here our teachers have been preparing all week for them today, and thank you teachers, thank you parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents for bringing them today. I want to encourage you to bring them. This is generation now, the next generation of Messianic leaders and believers, and so let's just extend our arms and bless them as we've, the scripture declares. Over the girls we say over you, Yisim Ech Elohim, Kesara Rivka Rachel. Valea. May God make you girls like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel and Leah, the blessed mothers of Israel. And for you boys, ye simcha Elohim, ke Ephraim, vichi menashe. May God make each one of you boys like Ephraim and Manasseh as you build up Israel in your generation. Lord, I thank you for each one of these kids today, Lord, that you've got something special to impart into their lives by the Ruach Kodesh today, by your Spirit. So, Lord, teach them and train them. Father, bless our teachers. Bless those who brought them, Lord, as they see their children grow up as straight as trees of life, within tree of life. Thank you for their lives. In the name of the one who has ransomed us, Yeshua, and all of God's people said, amen. Kids, thanks for being here today. Remain standing, if you would, with me as we open up the ark today. We process it through the congregation. It's our opportunity to express affection for his word. We're not worshiping idols or anything like that. We're just honoring the Lord, the word made flesh in our midst. Let's open the ark today. Vayahi bin Soah Aaron, Vayomer Moshe, Kuma Adonai, Veafutsu Hohivecha, Vehanusu Misanecha, Mipanecha, Ki Mitsion. Tate Torah, Ki Mitzion, Tate Torah, Udvar Adonai, Me Yerushalayim, Baruch Shenatan. Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Le'amo Yisrael, Bihikdu Shato.
Father, we recite back to you your word found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and forward, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Mahalchuto Le'olam va'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious malchut, his kingdom, which is forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Shabbat shalom. amazed, continually amazed with how the Lord loves us, how he finds us. We're broken, we're lost, and he comes along and speaks to us and picks us up and heals us and draws us to himself, gives us a reason to be and to continue. We just thank you, Lord, for everything that you are to us.
God, he's our king, he is our Lord, he is Mashiach. And we're thankful today Governor John Hancock of Massachusetts in 1790 said this, I appoint a day of public thanksgiving and praise to render to God the tribute of praise for his unmerited goodness toward us by giving to us the Holy Scriptures, which are able to enlighten and make us wise to eternal salvation, and to present our supplications that He would forgive our manifold sins and cause the benign religion of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, to be known, understood, and practiced among all the inhabitants of the earth. Mr. Elias Boudinot said, quote, he could not think of letting the congressional session pass without offering an opportunity to all the citizens of the United States of joining with one voice and returning to Almighty God their sincere thanks for the many blessings he had poured down upon them. And with this in view, he brought forth the following resolution, quote, resolved that a joint committee of both houses be directed to wait upon the President of the United States to request that he would recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer. 
The resolution was delivered to President George Washington, who agreed with this request, declaring, quote, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor, now, therefore, I do appoint Thursday, the 26th day of November, 1789, that we may all unite to render unto Him our sincere and humble thanks for His kind care and protection. I want to wish you all an early Thanksgiving. Enjoy your families. Enjoy the day off as we worship God on this day. We have a number of special guests here today. With no further ado, guys, if you have that DVD ready to go, I want to quickly introduce, uh, uh, he'll come up after the video. We have the executive director here of the Joseph Experience. He's a good friend of over two decades to my wife and I. His wife is here as well. The Joseph Experience, before we show you on the DVD quickly is a two-hour stop and he'll of course uh, highlight this as well where tours to go to Israel are able to come to the National Warehouse of the Joseph Project near Jerusalem, learn about the Joseph Project, have lunch, pack emergency kits, and generally provide relief, a uh, real help to the state of Israel's poor. The purpose of the Joseph Experience is to raise awareness in the Messianic community, to raise awareness in the Christian community of the challenge of Israel's poverty and provide them an opportunity to partner with the Messianic body in Israel through the Joseph Project to aid, to bring aid and comfort to our people for the glory of the Messiah Yeshua. Guys, if you look at One in four families in Israel and around one-third of all Israeli children live at or below the poverty line. Much of Israel's resources are used for national defense, leaving limited social services to help the poor and needy. This is where we can make a difference to help the people of Israel. Since the year 2000, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America's Joseph Project has imported over 500 truckloads filled with approximately $100 million of humanitarian aid to help the poor in Israel. One example of the work being done every day in Israel by the Joseph Project was a recent distribution of aid in the booming city of Rishon LeZion. Rishon LeZion means the first to Zion, but some of the last people to be remembered are the elderly. We were there to show them support and that they're not alone. Rishon Etzion uh, is uh, now one of the most uh, growing city in Israel. Of course, we, we are doing a lot uh, to help uh, uh, people that can't uh, manage by themselves. Uh, we are talking about old people, uh, about people that uh, had uh, any other needs, uh, handicaps and uh, so on, of course. I am very happy that you are here in Israel and you help many uh, citizen Joseph project it's a wonderful project and it's, it's a it's a great opportunity to thank you for what you are doing for us thank you very much במוסד הזה, קיבלנו חיתולים במוסד הזה, קיבלנו שמחות חד פעמיות במוסד. אם נוכל ל, לאדם גריאטר שהוא חסר ישע, ואני רוצה להגיד לך, ג'ים, ולכל אלה שעושים מאחורי הקלעים, תודה רבה ויישר כוח ותמשיכו ככה לעזור לאנשים הנזקקים. In 2014, through the help of partners like you and the generosity of Joe and Cindy Gregory, we dedicated a new warehouse in the foothills near Jerusalem. Well, it gives us a great feeling to know that this is the next chapter and an important chapter for us to be working together with the MJAA to open up its new warehouse and national headquarters in Jerusalem. It was amazing to see high-level government officials. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs was there, mayors of cities, members of Knesset. All of them gathered to commend the good work of the Joseph Project. We honor you with this day, a true friends of Israel. And I would uh, like to thank you on behalf of the, my resident. Thank you again for inviting me for uh, doing what you do. And uh, please keep up with the work. 
One of the most moving moments in the evening for me was in seeing the retired General Gazelle get up and share unexpectedly. You came here to celebrate this beautiful uh, project that I see for the first time, but I heard about it because I have two kids that serve in the military. They told me, like others, what you have done with this project for uh, the soldiers in Gaza Strip while they were f fighting uh, during the war. So thank you so much again. You are welcome in Israel. Hope to see you uh, again uh, every year. Thank you so much. Todaraba. This has been the realization of a dream and a vision God gave to us in 1996. And here we are today, to God be the glory. The Joe and Cindy Gregory AIDS Center for Israel serves as the Joseph Project's headquarters and distributes clothing, furniture, medical supplies, food, basic necessities, war survival kits, and much more to reach the people of Israel for their physical and spiritual restoration. Thank you for your continued support. Yeah, let's give the Lord a clap offering. The Lord is doing some amazing things. I want to introduce to you, if you would welcome uh, Messianic Congregational Leader Robert Black, who's the Executive Director of the Joseph Experience, to just give us a couple more minutes of explanation and how you can partner as well. Bob, let's give him a warm, a warm welcome. Okay, this is a great beamer. This is great. Whoa, you guys, had, do you know how... How blessed you are! Your your this building, I mean, and th this room, and uh, I hope you know how blessed you are to have the leaders that you are, Joel and Darcy. I'm. They they are the leaders of the leaders in the movement, and you are very blessed to to have them. You really are, and to live in San Diego too, by the way. Well, you all know about the Joseph Project, because when you come to the conferences, right about here is when Joel Chernoff takes the offering after, after the movie, okay? We're not doing that today. But the Joseph Project ha has been uh, just an amazing thing. Miraculous things have been happening. It's been slow for years, and then about the last three years it's taken off like a skyrocket. Now it's doubling every year, and there's not time to go into all that now, but uh, it's, it, God is really, really blessing. What I'm overseeing is a brand new aspect of that, and Joel gave you the whole speech, perfect, better than me. Okay, the Joseph experience is what I'm doing, which allows your tour groups to Israel to experience the Joseph Project by going to the warehouse and actually packing the emergency bomb shelter kits, seeing the operation, and by the way, it's extremely impressive. Really, it's just first, first class. And we give you a free lunch. And, and the reason is, well, like Joel said, that the groups become aware of what the Lord is doing through the MJAA and will, and will pray for us. So, you don't have a tour plan that I'm aware of, so why am I here today talking about this? Well, here's, here's how you can help. And I'm not taking an offering, okay? If you, I'm gonna have this literature out probably on the back uh, over there after the service. If you know a leader who's going on a tour to Israel, who's taking a tour, if you know a leader who wants to go, if you know someone who is going, someone who wants to go, or anything like that, take these things and give them to them. They can see what we're doing and have them call me and I'll give them a further explanation. Just one quick thing though, I want to, to tell a, a brief story. Some of the miracle stories that, that are coming out are, are, are phenomenal. Um, Jim at, at the warehouse, he, he's the executive director of, on site in Israel, uh, gets a call from a Chinese group that don't speak English and the guide spoke Hebrew and Mandarin, so he speaks Hebrew, so you see how this is working, right? And they're, they're going to come in a half an hour and, that, and that's the only notice that we had. Okay, a full busload of Chinese. The, okay, you have to understand who is blessing us. These are Chinese from China, communist China, who are wanting to bless Israel and bless Jews. God is doing amazing things. And so they come and so, yeah, he is, it's amazing. And so all of our DVDs are like in Hebrew and English. And, and they're Chinese, what, what do we do? He remembered that this group had sent a container of blankets, blue and white, for Israel, blankets, and he, they videoed it, they filmed it. He got the video out and he showed it. And this group, these are the people that sent the, the, the container from China. 
And now they're in Israel where the container ended up, and they get to see who gets it, how it's being unloaded, and who is receiving their gifts. And look, look at what the Lord did. As you can see, none of this is planned. God orchestrates this. Watch this. Okay, as they unloaded the blankets and gave them away, okay, they were to a group of brand new immigrants, Jewish immigrants, okay, from northern India on the border of Mongolia. They're Chinese, okay? They're Chinese. And these people are, look, are, are looking at that. That's us. Those are us. So the, the Lord orchestrated that, the whole thing that go around this way and around that way, that the Chinese people blessed the Chinese Jews when they, when they welcomed them to Israel. Only he can do that. And there's a ton of those stories. So pass the word, all right? Have this back in the back. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Amen. Well, before Bob was the executive director of the Joseph Experience, he was quote-unquote, the interim congregational leader of Adon HaMashiach in Irvine. That interim position lasted 15 years, by the way. Bob and Susan, it's so great to have you. They're close family friends. Actually, I met my wife through their congregation over 20 years ago. I stole her. A draft choice came my way. Praise God. Well, we have a special treat today. I have not connected with this brother in probably over 15 years, but when I heard he was coming to San Diego to actually Kahila Ariel tonight, he's doing a fundraising event for them. I said, I've got to have you here in the morning for Shabbat. Uh, Rob Styler, quick introduction. God told Moses the story of creation. He told the story of what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He told the prophets about the coming of the Messiah. When, he, when Yeshua came, he told us, Yeshua told us stories of the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua spoke about a prodigal son. He spoke about a sower. He spoke about workers in the vineyard. We learned about Lazarus and his place in heaven through a story. And Yeshua told us the ultimate and greatest story about his redemption of those who would trust in him. How many of you know our God is a storyteller in the best sense of the word? And this is the ministry of Second Adam, a ministry that continues in the tradition of sharing the story of our God through stories, teaching the Bible one story at a time. Rob is the missions director of CJMF Ministries. It's a Jewish ministry. He's a graduate of Moody Bible Institute out of Chicago. He majored in Jewish and modern Israel studies. He's a wonderful brother. I'm going to ask you to put, a, put your hands together with a warm San Diego welcome. Would you welcome storyteller, biblical storyteller, Rob Styler from Second Adam. Hallelujah. With his watermelon yarmulke on. Not sure how that happened. A lot of stuff, Joel. <laughs> Thanks. The uh, watermelon yarmulke is very easy to explain. If you've ever had watermelon in Israel, it's the absolute best that there is. So, is my mic on? Yes. No. I have the green light. I can't do the volume from here. I could do it from in here, but I can't. <clears throat> okay. Yes, good? Is everybody happy? It's almost impossible to have everybody happy in a congregation. So I'm going to just savor that for a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. And as Bob was talking about, uh, you know, when you go to different congregations, seeing a nice building is really great. And I don't know how the ladies' room is, but... In the men's room, we have this really fancy tile that looks like stones. Is that in the ladies' room as well? Leaves. Okay. I just want to let you know that I did not go into... I thought I, I, thought I would ask. Uh, one time, <clears throat> many years ago, we used to have a retreat on the East Coast called Simcha. And all the Northeast congregations would get together. And we had it at Word of Life in upstate New York. They have fabulous facilities. But they were incredibly conservative. And we had a lot of different little issues. One of the things was they shut the pool on Sunday. And we tried to explain to them we'd prefer to have the pool shut on Saturday. But they wouldn't do it. And they just had like all these little rules. So you always had to be careful in case you did something wrong. And one day I went down to the pool. And you had to get changed down at the pool. And I went down there and 
big locker room and I took a spot in the corner so I would remember. You know, I learned that from parking lots. I have to know where I drop my stuff off so I could find it. So went swimming, came back, looked in the corner. My stuff's not there. So I looked all over. I thought maybe it was a different corner. Went back and forth and back and forth. Long story short, eventually I had this horrifying thought. And I went to my wife and I said, Hey, would you do me a favor? Would you go in the women's locker room in the corner and see if my clothes are in there by any chance? And sure enough, in the conservative of conservative places, I just happened to disrobe and re-robe. But uh, I thought, oh, I, how could I ever explain that if I ever got caught? <clears throat> Impossible. And Joel, I so appreciated your reading about uh, Thanksgiving and the proclamation. And it was so, that's really interesting. But I had the thought that that may have been the last time that Congress agreed on anything. Uh, in 17, whatever it was. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's very possible. I'm going to look that up at home. Is that me? Okay, I'll ignore it. <coughs> Uh, this morning I'm going to tell you a story about Levi or Matthew from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I like it because it's a great story, weaves a lot of interesting things. And I know that some of you, you know, like you hear Matthew and you start thinking, oh, is that the long one? It is long, but we're not going to cover every event, so we'll kind of give a little overview of it. Uh, this story is called From Tax Man to Soul Man. And it's the story of Matthew. Oh! I hate to travel through time. <laughs> you never know where you're going to wind up or how you're going to wind up. You know, one day I came out and... I That's another story. Shalom! Shalom! My name is Levi. Uh, that's kind of the response I usually get. Yeah. Most people know me by my pen name, Matthew. I'm the one that wrote that book. The Good News According to Matthew. You know, that book was so well written that everyone got together and decided they would give me the lead-off position in the New Covenant. <laughs> Not bad for a first book, huh? <laughs> It's been about 2,000 years and I'm still working on the sequel. <laughs> Just can't seem to follow that one up. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I lived in a small village called Capernaum, which was right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, of the Canaret. And it was a great place to live. But it was an even better place to work. I know... What some of you are thinking when you hear that. Work. So, what did you do for a living? <laughs> There's one question that I have come to hate more than any other. It's the old, what did you do for a living question. For me, it was always a great way to make some new enemies. I used to be, used to be, a tax collector. Not income tax. But I collected customs, which is why I lived on the edge of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. If you were willing to look, there was always somebody who was sailing something on that sea. And if you looked really hard, you could always find someone that you could tax. <laughs> yes? Uh, that might be a little hard for me, but I'll, I'll do... Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah. Yes, can I try with the mic? Sure. Okay. This is going to continue to pop. Yeah. Okay. something out on that sea. 
and always find someone who acts. Now, in my day, we happened to be under the rule of the Romans. And it was because of that that our governor, Herod, who was known locally as the ever popular, he had the responsibility to collect all the taxes that the Romans demanded. And we did this in a very special way. What the Romans would do is hold an auction. And whoever had the highest bid, that person won the right to collect all the taxes that the Romans demanded. And the best part of the whole system was that no one, except for the winner of the auction and the government, no one had any idea of the exact amount we had agreed upon. So a tax collector could charge anything that they liked. It was such a beautiful system. <laughs> now my special ability was that I could look at a person, and just by looking at them, I could tell exactly what they could afford to pay. And once I made that decision, I doubled it. <laughs> And the person would always say the same thing. How much? But I don't want you to get the wrong impression about me. Because I would always offer to lend that person the money they needed to pay those taxes. <laughs> With a special interest rate just for that. Oh, yeah. You might be able to see that tax collectors were not the most popular people in this world. I always got the same question from my countrymen. Hey, Levi, what kind of a Jew are you that you would cooperate with our enemies? What kind of Jew was I? The kind that liked to make a good living. But by far, the most popular question was always the same. Taxman, why do you charge more than you have to? Well, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Collect less? Mm -hmm. I have to make a living too. And it's one of the reasons I really like living in the park. Now, if you've never been to Israel, there's one thing I can tell you about us. One thing that drives everyone crazy. And that is that we cannot stand to be under anyone else's rule. Mm -hmm. From the second the Roman government took over, there was talk all over the land of Israel of some Messiah that was going to come and set us free. <coughs> One day, there would be talk of this end of Israel. And here, the people had found the true Messiah. And the next day, there was talk on the other end of Israel. And for sure, here was the real Messiah. I never paid any attention to all these Messiah sightings. <laughs> You know who the Messiah was for? He was for all the dreamers. Huh. I didn't need any Messiah. I already had a good life. And besides, just for the sake of argument, let's say there really is this coming Messiah. What in the world is he going to have to do with me, tax collector? I bet you that even if this Messiah came, he would stay as far away from me as he could. And me from him. I didn't know too much about the Messiah, but nobody ever told me that he was a big taxpayer. So who expects to be him? Well, as time goes on, there's more and more of these Messiah sightings. But they stopped being about all different people, and they started to focus in on this one man a man that people called Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Now today I heard there's many people that call him Jesus, but when I met him, that was his name. And the story started to come in the office every day. Yeshua's in this village and he's healing the sick, and Yeshua's in that village and he's casting out demons. And the stories got more and more common until one day a friend of mine rushes in the office and he said to me, Levi, You'll never guess who's in downtown Capernaum. It's this Yeshua that everyone's talking about. Why don't we go down there, and if we're really lucky, maybe he'll do one of those miracle things. And I said to him, Yeshua is in our town. Well, isn't that exciting? 
hey, listen, why don't you run down there, get us a couple of really good seats, and I'll meet you in about five minutes. Like, I'm really gonna go see this Yeshua character, right? Well, the next day, I'm sitting in the office, and a man walks in. There was nothing that was really special about him, nothing that stood out. But the second I saw him, I knew it had to be this Yeshua that everyone's talking about. He walks right up to me, looks me straight in the eye, and he said, follow me. So I got up, and I went with him. It's okay. I was on my lunch hour. <laughs> It only took a few days of hanging around and before even I start to think, maybe he really is the Messiah. And I decided what I was going to do was have a big party at my house, invite everyone I knew, most of whom were tax collectors like myself, but I also happened to know a regular assortment of all kinds of sinners. And I threw them all in the house too. And when you got that kind of crowd together, didn't take much for the action to get started. Some Perushim showed up. You might call them the Pharisees. They came into the party and they went right up to one of the more regular followers of Yeshua and they said to him, tell me, why would your master want to eat with tax collectors and sinners if he really was the Messiah? I think you would know a little better than that, wouldn't you? When I heard that, I was really angry. I mean, first of all, I never even invited them to the party. <laughs> I don't know how they even heard about it, right? Bad enough they show up. Now they're going to cause some trouble. So I decided the best thing to do was just to be, get over there and throw them all out. But I never made it. Because while I was on my way over, it was Yeshua who spoke to them. He said, you need to go and learn what the scripture means when it says that I desire mercy, not your sacrifices. I've come to call the sinners back to God, not to worry about people who already think they're righteous. Whoa. When most of my friends heard that, they thought it was great. They never heard anybody talk to the Pharisees like that, and they loved it. But me, I was blown away. A teacher from God who loved tax collectors. That was almost too big to be true. Well, one by one, those Pharisees decided to leave the party, and when they left, Yeshua spent the entire night teaching us all about the kingdom of God. And it was that night that I decided to spend all my time with him. And over the next three years, we traveled all over the land of Israel. And I saw and heard things that I will never forget. I remember at the very beginning, Yeshua was teaching this group of people about the kingdom of God. When in the middle of his teaching, some rabbi from the local synagogue runs up, makes his way through the crowd, and he said to Yeshua, Teacher, my daughter has just died. If you will come, just, just put your hand on her. You could bring her back to life. Well, I wasn't so sure about that. I never saw anybody come back from the dead, did you? Yes. yes. But Yeshua, he just gets up and goes with the rabbi. There was nothing we could do but to follow along. We're almost at the rabbi's house. You can hear the funeral music, it was so loud. And we walked into his house. The place was filled with mourners. And Yeshua calls a rabbi over and he said to him, listen, this girl isn't dead. She's only sleeping. Ask everyone to go outside. Well, you should have heard the crowd when he said that. Second thought, it's probably better you didn't do that. They thought that he was losing his mind. The girl was obviously dead. We had all seen dead people before. But the rabbi? Yeah, 
acts like it's a normal request. He gets everyone to go outside, and when they did, Yeshua goes up to the girl, he kneels down before her, takes her hand, and when he did, that girl jumped up, just like, hey, amen. The girl wasn't the only one jumping up, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it was after that that we became some of the most popular people in all of Israel. If I had to pick one time, it's one series of events that stands out in my mind more than any other. It was the time when Yeshua heard about the death of his cousin, Yochanan. Now, Yochanan was known for immersing people who wanted to follow God. But he was also known for something else. Yochanan would say anything to anyone at any time. Oh. <laughs> and that is what got him into trouble. <laughs> One day, he went up to the ever-popular and said to him, have you ever given any thought, I mean, any thought at all, to the fact that it might be wrong for you to be dating your brother's wife. Well, the old ever popular, when he heard that, he was furious. He wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of John. People loved him so much. So what he decides to do instead is to put John in jail. Now, while John is in jail, it came time for Herod's birthday. And he decided he deserves a huge birthday bash. <coughs> Invites everybody who is anybody in the entire kingdom, including Herodias, his brother's wife, and her daughter. Now the party is really going along and, well, if you knew Herod, you know he was quite the party boy. He was really enjoying himself when all of a sudden he got the brilliant idea that he would like to see some dancing. So he calls for the daughter of Herodias to come in. She does a special dance prepared just for Herod. <laughs> well, the old ever popular, when he saw that, he just lost control of himself. And he gets up off his chair and he said to the girl, that. <laughs> That was the greatest dancing I have ever seen. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will give you anything, anything that you would like, up to one half my kingdom. Half the kingdom. The girl doesn't know what to do. So she decides to go outside and ask her mother. None of you here actually knew Herodias, right? <laughs> Right, let me sum her up by this. Herodias was never in the running for the Mom of the Year award. <laughs> Girl goes outside and says, Mom, I could have anything I want up to half the kingdom. Half the kingdom? I know. Why don't you ask for the head of John on a dish? Head of John on a dish? Girl goes outside and tells Herod what she wants, and when he hears, he realizes it's a very serious problem. Because he's afraid of John. But in the end, he decided he was more frightened of his dinner guests. He sends into the jail, has John beheaded, puts the head on a dish, and gives it to the girl. She takes that head, she goes out, she gives it to her mother. Nice family, the Herods. <laughs> when John's people heard what happened, they came to get his body. And then they went and told Yeshua. Now I was with him when he heard the news about his cousin. You could see the grief that was in his face. And he said to us, I must be alone. And with that, he left us and went off into this valley. The only problem was that all the people that lived in the villages around the valley heard that it was Yeshua and that he was there in the valley. 
And when they heard that, they came from all of those places, and soon that valley was filled with people. When Yeshua saw them, he put his own sorrow aside, and he started to teach them and to heal them. Well, went on for the entire day. I had never seen anything like it. And when evening approached, I went to him. Master, better start to send these people away because it looks like they're getting a little hungry and we have nothing to do. He said to me, you know, I have an even better idea. Why don't you feed them? Us. Do you know what we had? We had five loaves of bread and two fish. Now there was at least 5,000 men in that crowd and I couldn't even count the women and children. And I, I said, Master, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, great. <laughs> Go get it. Now to be honest with you, my first thought was that maybe the grief about John's death was clouding his thinking. And I thought when he saw the food, he would clearly understand the problem. So he brought him the food and he doesn't say anything. He lifts it up towards heaven and he blesses it and he gave it back to us. I want you to take this food, you give it out to everyone and let them eat until they're full. Now, I almost said something else to him at this point, but I thought, how long could this possibly take? <laughs> Two minutes? So we started to give the food out to the people, and they ate. And we gave them more food, and they ate more. And we gave them more food until no one wanted anything else to eat. And when he saw they were finished, he called us over. Would you do just one more thing? Would you go out and gather up all of the leftovers? Leftovers. We went out into that crowd, and you know what we had? We had 12 full baskets of leftovers. One basket each. And we brought them up and we set them down before him. And I said to him, How did you do that? And he said, Not now. I need to be alone. Get in the boat and meet me on the other side of the lake. So we got into the boat, and we started to row out into the lake. And the further we row out into the lake, the more the wind starts blowing. And the more the wind starts blowing, the bigger the waves are getting. And the bigger the waves are getting, the more this boat is rocking until this boat is almost flipping over. I told you from the beginning, right? I'm the tax man. I hate boats. <laughs> I never would have been in a boat. I was scared. Five minutes later, the fishermen were frightened. And by now, I was petrified. And then they started screaming. Every last one of them. Especially James and John, you know, the big sons of thunder. <laughs> Not that day. They were screaming louder than anyone else. And we are in the boat, and the wind is blowing, and the waves are going, and this boat is rocking. And I thought to myself, at least this can't get any worse. That is when I saw the ghost. <laughs> can't be, right? It's a ghost, and he's walking on the water towards our boat. Now, I knew that my friends were already frightened enough, and I didn't want to let them know this latest development <laughs> in a way that would add to their anxiety. So I looked at my friends, and I looked at the ghost, and I looked at my friends, and I said to them, it's a ghost! <laughs> Which didn't exactly have the effect that I want. <laughs> and the wind is blowing, and the waves are going, and the boat is rocking, and the ghost is coming, and on top of all of this, we hear a familiar voice. Don't be afraid. It's only me. It was Yeshua. And he's walking on the water towards the boat. Now I was sitting next to Kipo when this happened. And he said, if that's really you, 
Then tell me to come out on the water with you. And Yeshua said, come on. And he gets up out of the boat and he starts walking and he takes a few steps, but all of a sudden he had a major change in his attitude. Stops walking and he starts sinking and as he's thinking, he starts yelling and all we could see is, oh, oh, until the only thing visible were the tips of his fingers sticking out of the water. Now by that time, Yeshua had come over to where he was, reached down and touched his fingertips, and when he did, Tifa popped up out of the water like a cork. <laughs> and Yeshua said to him, what in the world is the matter with you? Don't you have any faith at all? Tifa said, oh yes I do. I am a man of great faith, great faith. And they made their way back over to the boat. And the second they sat down, the wind waves disappeared. One minute you, you couldn't hear yourself think. And the next there was not a sound. And we all turned to him and we said, you really are the son of God. But he told us not to tell anyone. He told us that he was going to go to Jerusalem. And there he would be killed. Well, that made no sense to me. Right? He's really the Messiah, which I came to believe. Then he's supposed to have a kingdom. And if he's really the Messiah, and he really has a kingdom, how could he possibly be dead? I just couldn't understand it. And the more time went on, the more he spoke about his death. And the more he spoke about his death, the less we paid attention to him. He could have blamed us, really. I mean, Everywhere we went, the ministry was picking up steam. The crowds were getting bigger. You just should have been there the day that we came into Jerusalem. Yeshua rides a donkey into town. The place was mobbed. My first thought was, maybe Springsteen's in town. <laughs> I mean, it was crowded like that. And the people are throwing palm branches as we came in, and they're shouting out, Blessed are you. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. I thought to myself, this is it. We made it. It's the beginning of the kingdom. And the next day, nothing. Just the 12 of us and him sitting outside of the temple. And he said, it is only two days until the Passover. And that is the day that I will be killed. You know how frustrating that was? Every time things went our way, he talked about dying. It was driving us crazy. Well, the next day, we did celebrate our Passover. We had all gotten together and had barely started the Seder when Yeshua stopped. And he looked around the table at all of us and he said, I'm telling you the truth. There's one of you here that's going to betray me. I was stunned. I mean, everybody was. And we started going around the table. We said, it can't be me. Who could it be? It can't be me. And we got all the way around the table until we got to Judas. Now, between you and me, I never liked Judas anyway. <laughs> He was always sneaking around. You had to watch him all the time. And he turns and looks right at Yeshua and said to him, It's not me, is it, Rabbi? And Yeshua said, It is you. Go and do it. And Judas got up and he went outside. And I had this feeling that something <coughs> bad was going to happen. But we continued to say her almost to the very end when Yeshua decided to go outside and pray. There was a small garden that was near our house. Yeshua went off from us and started to pray. And I don't know how long he was praying. But all of a sudden I heard a noise. And I looked up and I saw this crowd. It was a big crowd, angry crowd. Some of them had sticks and some of them had swords. And it looked like they were coming over to us. 
When Yeshua heard them, he stood up and he pointed in the crowd. Look, here comes my betrayer. That was the first time I saw Judas. He was at the head of the crowd. And he stepped up to Yeshua and he took him in his hands and he kissed him. He said, greetings, Rabbi. And when he said that, the entire crowd rushed forward and they grabbed Yeshua and they carried him off. When we saw that, we just all scattered in different directions. There's one thing that people have asked me about more than any other. It was about this. They always say to me, why did you leave him? If I was there, I would have stayed with him. You know the problem with that? Nobody that ever says that was actually in the garden with us. It was dark, and that crowd was really angry. And I'll tell you something, something I'm ashamed of. When I saw that they wanted him and not me, I was almost relieved. They carried him off. They took him over to the priest's house. When they got him there, they had what they called a trial. They got all the enemies of Yeshua gathered together and they all started to tell their stories about him, but it was a problem. No two stories seemed to agree. So finally, out of frustration, the priest has Yeshua brought before him. And he said to him, I have one question for you and only one. Are you the Messiah? the son of the living God? Yeshua looked at the priest and he said to him, what you say is true. And one day you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven. When the priest heard that, he tore his robe. And he turned to the leaders of the people and he said, you heard it? You've all heard it, haven't you? You've heard the blasphemy from his own mouth. Tell me. What does the law say should be done with a man like this? And the leader said, he should be killed. He should be brought over to Pilate and killed. <coughs> so they brought Yeshua over to Pilate, the Roman governor. And when they come before him, he's confused. He sees Yeshua and the big crowd. And he says to the leaders, you know, I, I don't understand what's going on. And he starts to question them. And then he turns back to Yeshua and he asks him what's going on. And then he comes back to the leaders and he said, you know, I'm still confused. What exactly has this man done? And the leader said to him, you don't have to understand. All you have to do is kill him. Just kill him. <coughs> Pilate he was a very smooth politician. He saw he had the beginnings of a riot on his hands. So he calls for one of his servants to bring him a bowl of water. And he washes his hands in front of the leaders and he said to them, I have nothing to do with the death of this man. I am innocent of all his blood. And once he said that, he turned Yeshua over to the soldiers. The soldiers took him over to the governor's palace and when they got him there, they took his robe off him and they made him wear a scarlet robe. One of the soldiers had weaved the crown out of thorns and they took that and jammed it down on his head. And they made him sit before them. And while he sat there, the soldiers came up to him. And they said, hey, you're the king of the Jews, right? <laughs> What a pleasure having a king with us. We've never had somebody like you. Thank you so much for coming to visit us. Hey, tell me, oh great king, can you ruin your kingdom for a servant like me? I'll be a good servant. And they laughed at him. They spit at him. They hit him until they were bored. And when they were finished, they took him out to the place of the skull. When they got him there, 
They took his clothes <laughs> off him again. And they nailed him up on the beam. And on top of his head there was a sign that said, This is Yeshua, the King of the Jews. And while he hung there, some of the leaders came by to see him. Hey, I recognize you. You're the son of God, aren't you? Hey, son, maybe your father doesn't know where you are. Why don't you call out and let him know? <laughs> hey, look who it is. It's the man who saved everyone else. Why don't you save yourself now? Come on, come down from there. You can do it. But Yeshua stayed there. And he hung there. Until he died. It was the most difficult day of my life. I had given up everything to follow him. I believed that he was the Messiah. And now, he was dead. We went back to Jerusalem that night. Me and my ten friends. And went into a small room and locked the door. No one spoke. What could we say? He was dead. But the next morning, two women we knew came to see us. This woman, Miriam, from the city of Magdala, and her friend, another Miriam. And they started to talk about how much they loved him. And they said, there must be something we can do for him. There must be one last thing. And we said to them, he is dead. It's over. What in the world can you do for a dead man? But they insisted. And finally they decided what they were going to do was to go down to his grave and make sure that every last detail of his burial was taken care of. And early the next morning, they went down to the grave. But when they got there, you know what they saw? An angel. And his clothes were white like snow. And his appearance was like lightning. And when he saw the woman, he said to them, Who are you looking for? And they said, We've come to see Yeshua. We want to make sure that everything has been done for him. The angel told them, Yeshua is not here. He's already come back from the dead just like he promised. Amen. Go. Tell his disciples to meet him on the mountain in Galilee. The women got up and they started to come back to tell us the news, but before they got to us, do you know who they saw? Yeshua himself. And when he saw them, he said to them, Shalom Aleichem. And they saw him in fell down and started to worship him. But he said to them, Not now. Go, tell my brothers to meet me on the mountain in Galilee. The woman came back and told us the news. And we went out to go see him. And on the way there, I had 10,000 thoughts in my mind. And when we got to that mountain, I saw him. And that he was alive. The man that I had met three years before in that tax office, he had proved to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that he indeed was the Messiah. You know, people tell you all the time that hindsight is 2020, and that's true. Because when I saw him, I finally understood. I always understood the reason for the life of the Messiah. That was so obvious. <coughs> But now I understood the reason for his death. He died to pay the price for my sin. He gave his life so that I could have a new life. And everything he had done just fell into place. I started to... <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. That's... That's how the time travel always starts. <laughs> so one of the many reasons I just hate it. I need to get to a certain place, because if I'm not in the right spot, I won't wind up in the right place, and it's just, just trust me, I don't want to do that. But I'll tell you something. When that starts to happen to me, I realize that I don't have much time left. 
I know what you're probably thinking. You're all thinking, well, at least we have more time than he does. Well, the truth is, nobody really knows how much time they have. You might have a lot less time left than you think you do. Want to take some advice from an old tax collector? Spend all of the time you have no matter how much or how little. Getting to know and serving Yeshua. Because he really is exactly who he said he was. He is the Messiah. He's the son of the living God. Shalom. read a lot of books on preaching trying to hone that type of skill and anointing in my life but nothing beats a story you just got the entire good news of Matthew in 45 minutes Rob thank you so much I want us to respond to that Rob goes into Jewish communities all over the world with drama and can kind of go past some of the opposition as a story often does. And I don't know about you, but I want to empower that type of ministry. Normally we take up our tithes and offerings and we're going to do that right now, but I'm going to ask you to allocate a portion of what you were planning to give today to Rob. We will give him one check. You can make your checks out to Tree of Life, but allocate it under guest speaker to bless Rob. Rob's going to Israel, as he mentioned. I'm going to have a couple of ushers, if you'd come forward as well, to give these out as well. He's going in June. After Bob's presentation, maybe he'll uh, adapt his itinerary to stop at the Joseph Project and the Joseph Experience. But it's really quite tremendous. More cards as well, guys. Sorry. Daniel is also... You're getting a copy of his ministry brochure and his tour to Israel, and I'm going to ask you to join with me in prayer in a moment for to bless our brother. Rob, you've encouraged me in, in my communication today, skills, and um, it's an unusual anointing and it's a needed one, especially for our Jewish people today. Would you join me in prayer? Alvinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, we bless you today. We thank you for this presentation of the good news according to Matthew's account, Lord. We thank you that he's been with us here today, Lord, to get a little bit of a glimpse into what he was thinking, what he was doing. Father, we pray for our people here in San Diego, the 90,000 Jewish people that are going through motions and going through life, not knowing when the end of life will come, but not having Yeshua in their life. So, Father, we are watchmen and watchwomen on the walls here of our city for our people, along with Kehilat Ariel and a number of other ministries represented here in our city that are doing good work, that are out in the highways and byways. We pray for our own ministry on Saturday afternoons at Balboa Park with Frida and Cynthia and Daniel and Sophia and many others who have come beside the Magdalena and others, Terrence, Lucan and others who are down there exposing, Lord, their uh, insecurities of sharing the good news. Father, may we be encouraged today, Lord, that it can be done in so many different variety of ways to bring down the blinders. Lord, you're bringing it down. You're asking us to be available. So, Father, I thank you today as we have heard your word that we can Bless Rob and Second Adam Ministries and CJFM Ministries, Lord, as they are out there in Jewish communities all throughout the world, compelling our people to come back to a relationship with the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for this upcoming holiday, Lord, in our nation. 
Father, we know that as we spend time with our families, even this week, Lord, that uh, it's often an awkward time, an uncomfortable time, because much time has elapsed, and some things may not have been settled, even from last year at this time. So, Father, we ask that you would go deep into our family relationships this week, Lord. Heal up those fractures and fissures and divisions, possibly, Lord. It would be a time of restoration and reconciliation. As we gather around, Lord, exalting and worshiping you and thanking you for sending the Messiah of Israel and the Messiah of the nations. We give you praise today, Lord, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Ushers, if you'd receive the offering today. encourage you that um, we're going to have Hebrew resurrected in the month of January. Surely we'll be coming back to teach. We'll be in our new digs up in the upper campus January the 2nd. Keep that in prayer. I believe it's going to be in, uh, just an, a greater opportunity and exposure for what we're doing here. Our Jewish people need to see it. They need to see that there are Jews today that still believe and the promised and prophesied Messiah. If you'd stand with me today, we're going to dismiss. I'm going to encourage you to stick around for Elder Allen's Torah study in room 408 down the hall and get to know your brother and sister and wish them a Shabbat Shalom, a Shavua Tov, and a happy Thanksgiving. And I want to bless you in the way that the scriptures have done so and have instructed. Receive it in that way today. Yivarech Adonai Vayishmarecha Yair Adonai Panvelecha Vichuneheka Yish Adonai Panvelecha Vyasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance above you and grant you peace. In the name of the Sar Shalom, in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, and all of us as his people said, Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shavuot Tov.